share screen. So go ahead and download your notes. Hello. Yeah. From this week and then your unit six assignment. We'll go over the in class assignment together today, right now. You don't have to use the mask, yeah, but know. you can. Okay, so we are at 3 p.m. now. Um, this is a lot of information chapter, so I'm hoping that we can get through um, everything. And if not, we'll touch back on this when we cover a little bit of the lab this week. So this area might be interesting to many of you as we are going to get into a little bit of um, hi, pen tests and ethical hacking approaches. There is a class that's specifically dedicated to that, which is the 27B. Um, Mr. Anderson is teaching that online. So, but in this class, I want to introduce you to some areas and the notes that you're getting has content of the chapter, but I also add some materials outside of the chapter. So we are going to define some terminology and answer some questions. So let's go through. So in this chapter, it talks about threats. And we are going to look at different areas of threats um, and how that landscape will be when we build security solutions. So to start, we, you are going to look at an open source intelligence when you're using your lab this week. Um, I haven't tested through everything on the lab, but I think um, we are going to use a couple of the tools. So the open source intelligence is a way that we can gather information in social media and website. Um, in my Python class this week for 30C, we are using some of the tools in Python for that. But you can definitely use Tally tool in order to do this. Okay, so OSINT is a way that we can just simply scheme through and this will take a lot of time, okay? You want to build up as much information as possible on a target. And when you're doing pen testing, you have to focus on a group of targets or a target. So you want to find out public information. You sometimes need to go to the deep web to find stuff and you will need to document and so he can write your report. Um, so now <clears throat> in before we answer the next question, let's talk about different types of attackers. Okay. So a hacker terminology is often misunderstood or misinterpreted. So simply a hacker is someone that proficient in computing system that knows their way around the system. There are different categories of hackers. The book only gives you a couple, but in the industry, we classify them based on their purpose. Why hat? You hear this a lot. They are ethical hackers or pen testers. You can get paid to do this. You can hack for a living or you internally or externally. And sometimes they're often referred to as auditors. The second area, you see a lot of these also in the field, they're black hat. And these people are usually monetary driven or um, they don't sometimes, sometimes they fall into the hacktivist category, but they build tools to circumvent a network. And anytime that we circumvent a system, it's against the law, okay? The third area is your gray hat hackers. Many of the professionals fall into this category. Okay, that means that they're a cross between the two. So they don't have a malicious intention, but they also don't have a true benevolent intention. So there are times that 
boundaries are crossed, so they fall on, on, in between. You got the green hat, which are known as noobs, and they strive to become a full-blown attacker. They seek information, and a lot of the script kitties fall under the green hat. Okay, the red hat hackers report and defeat malicious hackers. So they are what I call the superheroes of our world. So they are a bounty buck hunter, um, and I can show you some of where you can participate in that. And also, lastly, your blue hat often are made up of your script kitties with the vengeance. So they are a little bit more malicious and just curious and trying to find scripts. They um, don't have a desire to learn. They are just, because they don't know the consequences, it tends to be a little bit more um, or uh, severe in the case if they do attempt something, okay? So your script kitties, okay? They use scripts to launch attacks and you can buy them from the deep web as a script kitty. You can also research. There are a lot of public information on how to find things, YouTube videos, etc. And they have no sophistication or little expertise. They want to try different things. These are also known as your homegrown hackers. So this is what you often see the industry referred as. So in your assignment, we would first identify the difference between your white hat and your black hat hackers. So you don't have to put down verbatim, but we can summarize that the white hat hackers, they are using tools to assess systems and networks. And when you do that, you would provide a report or a result for improvement. And that's really their job, right? To really provide a way to understand the vulnerability, the existing threat, and how we can reduce the risk in our network or in our infrastructure. The Black Hat hackers, they build tools to circumvent network so you, you will have one that's detecting issues on the network and the infrastructure for improvement purposes, which is the white hat. The black hat, they built the tool to circumvent the system for malicious intent. And the goals on these can be from monetary to fame, to recognition, to a lot of the areas. The hacktivists, they tend to fall under the recognition and politically driven goals. But the black hat hackers, they don't need to really compile a report for improvement at the end. Pen testers and ethical hackers do. And we'll talk about the difference between the pen tester and the ethical hacker in a later chapter. So at the beginning of the chapter, it really talks about different types of threat. An attacker is a form of a threat. Malware is a form of a threat. People that's leaking your data is a form of a threat. So that's what we call the insider threat, which is harder to detect than the external threat. Your script titties, your attackers, and so on. Hello. So you have to only identify two, at least two types of your threat actors. And we would start with looking at what type of threats we're facing, whether it's internal people that is ignorant to the security practice or somebody that's trying to circumvent our network, right? Okay, then another area that we really need to focus on is your advanced persistent threat, your APT. And you will hear this on the news a lot, right? What is an APT? It is a targeted attack against a specific entity. So, for example, China government sponsored groups of APT and they are specifically looking at 
U.S. organizations or other organizations for the intent to either leak data, obtain design, uh, find information about our warfare, etc. So you would see that APT in different nations is sponsored by the government, including our own government. Right? You have the NSA people that is working for our government. So the cyber warfare really is about how we will be able to address the weaknesses, right? And utilize that toward our advantage. And looking at that, we would see the same thing with other nations. So the roles of your state actors in the APT in that they are sponsored by the government or the state government. They have specific targets such as companies, organization, agencies, right? And they would try to complete successful attacks. So in a successful attack, what is really the outcome is to enter your system unauthorized, right? ways, really allowing them to be able to infiltrate and obtain data. So your data is really the goal in this, right? And in order to get the data, they have to access the system. So that's the role of your state actors in, in APT. Yeah, no problem. Any question? So when you Google APT in cybersecurity, you will find many different groups. They actually have a very long list, right? We documented them based on how they were discovered. So Russia has a group or multiple groups, right? Like Cozy Bear, et cetera. And then you also have you know, groups are from Iran, groups are from China, Vietnam, and also United States. Okay. So before we, we address number five, and you don't have to put verbatim, you can summarize what I wrote. You can refer to your notes and you can find all of these information. Okay, so the hacktivist, anonymous falls under the hacktivist group where they will launch, right, attacks to really have a drive to increase awareness about potential issues or existing issues, okay? And your, we talked about inside the threat, sometimes you would have attacks for competitive reason, and those are called competitor, right? So for example, when you have, when you have a Boeing design, some of our jets, right? Um, they produce planes. And so China wanted to obtain the design of Boeing and there was a leak a while back, two years ago, that one of the lead, right? Supposedly the lead design actually went to China and they were able to produce the duplicate or even better version of that jet. So there are competitive from government to government and agency to agency or even organizations, okay? So organized crime, you do see a lot of this happening also in the deep web where you would have, um, you would have, you know, drug trafficking, human trafficking, uh, people for hire to kill, uh, et cetera. So there are a lot of criminal activities that are happening in the cyberspace, we know that. Right, and looking at that, we have to also examine how the, the, the roles of these threat actors and how that plays into organizations and or nation. So here, I provide additional lists. I know your book gave you some, but you can find a lot of details online as well. So your state actors, we already talked about that. So if you're looking at China, these are some of the prevalent uh, APT you got the unit 61398, also known as the first APT, APT-1. You got Buckeye, Double Dragon, and they changed from time to time also. Um, 
So the People Liberation Army inside China, our government has actually was able to take pictures of um, unmarked warehouses where they function from, right? The Chinese government is completely denied of this. So there are above a thousand servers. So they have server farms that are specifically made for this. Um, and they produce malwares and water holes and different things, tools um, to be able to get right, organizations and people to leak data um, for attack purposes. You got Russia, you often hear cozy bear, fancy bear, voodoo bear, those are APT from Russia. And then the later ones, you would see them not identified to an APT yet, like Sandworm or Fin7. Um, and they've been operating mostly tracking in the mid 2000s. So they came actually later than the Chinese. And then the Iranian, uh, you would see Helix Kitty or Helix Kitten, Charming Kitten and Elfin. Those are some of the, the main ones. Um, and then you got North Korea. Those are the groups from North Korea. And US, you would see the equation group. Um, and then your uh, Israel is unit 8200, Vietnam, and the list goes on. So these are like the top, top ones that I put together. So a lot of the attacks that coming through from APT, you often see that they are denial of service or distributed denial of service. Basically, it would just exhaust your server or your systems, and then that way it cannot respond to requests. The life cycle, this is very close to what you would see the, the attack cycle would be. So in order to really initial the compromise in the attack, they really have to do the homework and any attacker would know that. So would achieve that through email communication, phishing, uh, finding the zero day, finding the malware, and target the, the victim. And a lot of the time it's customized to the target. Then once they have people that clicking on the links or, or downloading the things that they want, they would go through the process in creating backdoor. That's the next step, right? Um, and then finding way to encrypt their communication and be stealth when they're in. Backdoor is often uh, can be created via the software level. After that, they would move laterally by doing escalation of privileges, elevate themselves to root user or administrator. And then they would do the internal recon where they can gain more information, collect more information and the relationship between your systems and the data. And then once they are there, then they would move into controlling the workstations, building bots, um, and then maintaining presence sometimes for months and years. And that's common, right? A lot of the time when we're reacting to a breach, um, um, usually that's take about three months or more, okay? Uh, our, our system in detection lately, I think even from like our existing system and all across, you don't see people um, blocking and detecting earlier on. Very rarely that you would see that they monitor attack or threats effectively because they are, these people are very innovative in how they approach. Okay, so we are still failing in some point and this is why it drives the security for us. Um, so once they complete the mission, it will, the data is already sent to a different source outside of the victim's network. And so this, you can also find this on Wikipedia, right? I took this from Wikipedia and I provide you with the cycle on what that looks like, okay? Okay, so how do we really combat the APT, okay? We really need to do log analysis and this is the field that you're in. You have to really monitor and look at the logs closely, okay? Monitor your network traffic, monitor your activity, Attack creates a lot of noise, right? If you have a bunch of encrypted traffic coming through, see where that's coming from and how, you know, keep track of it because they would use that. Encrypted traffic is harder to really see the vector and see the data inside the content. 
So you have to really disassociate those systems quickly and see what, what happens, okay? Um, and then I put down additional information on how to really implement the technologies and to really detect. And then also use training and um, making sure that your, your humans are gonna not be the weakest link in, in security solutions. Okay, next question is your security syndicates. These are groups that work together for criminal activities, very much like your organized crime in the movies, right? Um, an example of this is your wizard spider. This is a Russian group um, that mainly distribute the ransomware. This is a newer ransomware that we see is Ryuk, and it mainly hit enterprises, a lot of the healthcare organizations, okay? All right, so let's answer the next few questions. So the motivation behind your criminal syndicates is to really gain money, of course, right? Billions and millions of dollars, so not small. Ransomware is a good business. People will pay to access their data from all ends. If you do look at some of the traction in this, right? Um, they can easily make millions of dollars in one shot. Sony cases were long ago, right? right? There was a demand of $50 million to release Sony resources. So we want to gain, uh, they want to gain money from distributing ransomware or malware, right, for malware attacks. Ransomware basically is a form of malware that encrypts your system, right, in, and it demands money. Okay, for the, the encryption key. Now, the malware really started with virus originally, and it's just a software that has malicious intention. So any form of code that can be downloaded and cause any harm to the system that becomes a malware, right? So the difference between a virus and a worm is that the virus, in order to get to your system, it needs the human intervention. That it needs to attach itself through the application, but you have to do the work in bringing it there. So they would use social engineer to trick the person to click to download or install something. Okay. Now, the host must execute and run the code, okay? So back in the 80s, how they could get people to run this is to, to take advantage of hidden uh, expile extension, right? So if you hear like code red and I love you virus and those things, right? People download the I love you virus because they thought it was an attachment that has, a, it's a love letter. So it uses the hidden file extension like the dot .bat. Back then the, the Windows OS would hide the file extension. People click download, that's how it got, got into the system. Now the worm, it is self-replicating. It travels through the network without human assistance, okay? So the worm doesn't need us to install to bring it to the system. Once it's in the network, it spreads very quickly, okay? There are worms that wipe out your boot sector. So that's been around since the XP era. There are worms that, so the worms do can do a lot of different things from, and a lot of the times it would corrupt your system files and that's the intention for malicious um, software. Okay, any questions? Next is your logic box. This is a code that's embedded in the application to execute based on a certain logic or event. From a programmer standpoint, all they have to do is to put in the criteria for logic. If this occurs, right, then this happens and so basically you're just implementing the conditions how you want certain events to take place and logic bomb tends to come in 
embedded in other applications. So they would build the code to be able to attach it in other type of files. Okay. So logic bomb can be very stealth. So you would hear the cases where people downloaded something months or a year ago. And as they don't meet the, the, the certain action, it doesn't activate until those actions take place. So for example, it will say, oh, activate this on the last day of the year, right? Or uh, if the user opened the application 50 times, right, activate this, okay? So logic bomb works that way. And, and, and as I mentioned, only about 60% of the malware is known, okay? The rest is just, so having the anti-malware is good, but it doesn't fully protect you 100% of the time, okay? And if people tell you that Mac OS is safer than Windows OS or Linux OS, that is basically just an over -an analysis of things. It's just more people are using Windows PC, so you would have a larger range of target compared to Linux or Mac OS. Now you do see a lot of stuff with iOS and Android because there are more systems there. Any question on this? Okay, make sure we know what the type of malware you will likely see that on Security Plus and other certification like A Plus. Okay. So here it talks about what a backdoor is and also what a Trojan horse is, okay? So a backdoor is usually left by or created by developers. It's a way to bypass authentication methods so that way they can go in and modify or edit things later on in the application. It's often being taken advantage of by attackers to get into the system because it overrides existing authentication so they can access different areas, including data, okay? So backdoor is dangerous. So the best way to really get a lot of the issues reduced is gonna be removing your backdoor, but development team's not gonna be happy about that, okay? Your Trojan horse is exactly like the story, right? It is a masquerading tool that would hide the malicious code. So the story goes that they, the, the army hid in the straw horse, right? And then at night they would attack. So the Trojan horse, what it is, is it hides in your common application, Microsoft Office tools, right? Um, your browser, things like that. So it gets embedded into the common application and that's how it enters your system. Trojan horse also can be a key logger Right, keylogger is usually hidden under other system to really listen for your keystroke and it would send that to the server that's listening. That's how they get your password and your information, okay? We already talked about ransomware. So if we're looking at the riot, it's netted $3.7 million in 52 transactions in 2018 right? Averaging $71,000 per transaction. So ransomware is a good business, right? All right, spyware, listen, we, we see this on our browser a lot, right? Your, your Chrome, unless you change your privacy setting, um, you know, your Amazon Echo, all of that, okay? Your adware is intent for marketing purposes, okay? And then your bots, are software robots. They are gonna be used to access your resources in your system. They can take over, uh, you know, use this in denial of service attack or distributed denial of service attack by making the system zombie, right? They, they just simply use the code, get the user to download it and use the resource processor, RAM and connection to launch, right, an attack aiming at someone, okay? So botnet, you hear that in the news a lot as well, okay? So those are infected system. Mirai, it was very common in 2016. Uh, this was aimed for the DNS servers. So therefore now you would see a lot of DNS servers are safe, but 
there are ways that you can search for unsafe servers. There are search engine that was created for that. And if you want to find out more, take 30C. So uh, bot herders are people who manage these bots, right? Not bots sometimes is used for like, you know, things on YouTube, things on social media, but they can also use for bad intent. Rootkits, watch out for those. They're very malicious. So rootkit usually access things at the low level. And so when you get a rootkit, often that you will have to fix it at the coding level. Um, so it access at root level system level, which has all privileges or full control or your kernel, which is at the hardware abstraction layer that's between your software and your hardware layer. They often stay in RAM and they can control a lot of the resources. So when you get a rootkit, um, it's a lot harder to fix compared to other. And even if you quarantine, right, we, we can't delete those files because our system files needs it. And at some time in this window system, it will modify your registry. Okay, command and control. These are often used to control infected system. It happens a lot with mobile platform lately. Trickbot uses this to uh, for for Trojan banking, so it would send you know uh, financial information to a certain resource and so on. So it masquerade under something else, and it infects a lot of the Android systems. Along with there are some iOS systems that were infected. So command and control is another new area that we see now uh, compared to what we've seen traditionally with malware. Okay, so for why do attackers use the back door is to really bypass authentication methods. We talked about that for question eight. For question nine, the purpose of ransomware is often they, it would be a Trojan to deliver the encryption. That's what they would use. So when we say a, a, a ransomware, it uses other malware in order to deliver that. Okay, that's the process. Um, and anti-malware company, they study the process and they reverse engineer some of the things to really look at the signature. And we'll talk about how that works. Um, and then it would demand, so after they deliver the encryption, it locks the drive, right, the storage, and then they would send the message to the target asking for the money um, to, get, to give them the key to decrypt the data. And often they, it might be a one-way encryption where they, it doesn't need to be put fully, right? It would be fake, right? Fake keys. So um, many companies now refuse to pay, right? And they would rebuild their data. So the combat for ransomware is as good as your backup. Make sure that your backup is effective and tested and always frequent, okay? That's the key. Okay, purpose of spyware is to really monitor the use of computers activities. Let me move this to the next page so you can see. Okay, and really looking at what you're looking at, like from your browser activities or, uh, you know, what you're doing on your computer, what kind of application you're running and so on. Your browser has does have some functionality in this, right? In the spyware area. We talked about the botnets. These are your software robots. They will look for information on the web access resources on the system and launch malware attacks. And then also a new area that we would see is your fileless virus. That means that the virus or the, the code doesn't stay in your normal hardware, hard drive, right? It doesn't go into your SSD or your hard disk drive, your HDD. It actually is instructed to download into RAM, which is harder to, to get rid of. And the techniques that's used to deliver the fileless virus is memory code injection. 
script-based techniques using Python or some form of script. It would um, also have, we would manipulate window registry if it's a Windows PC target, or it can be delivered in embedded files like Adobe Acrobat, Splat, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Adobe Flash, different areas, plugins. That's, there are many ways that you can get a malware into a system. Because if we understand that most system would need some kind of vehicle to do something, we would just attach it to that vehicle and that's how it can get to the majority of the mass. Okay. Any question on these? Okay. So here uh, on page four, it talks about fileless virus and also unwanted program. You guys ever download something and then all these other things that come with it, right? Even though they notify you, but it's not what you wanted, okay? So a lot of times that's how they can market some of the products. So those are called PUP, okay? So just be careful with those because through those, sometimes you would get malicious uh, software. Okay, so we talked about the fileless virus in here. I also give you some additional example, right? Uh, script, that script-based technique, there's a thing called SamSam, -Sam, and this is an encrypted code that's used. Um, and so it's very difficult to detect because it's encrypted, okay? And that's how they were able to deliver ransomware in the, in the uh, mission that's called Operation Cobalt Kitty, and that uses a PowerShell, right? Because when you run PowerShell, you actually, you can run it as an administrator, right? You saw how that can be ran. A lot of times we do, so that way we can execute something and that happens. It's like when you're using Kali Terminal, right? A lot of the functionality has to be at a super user. So that's how Linux can be also jeopardized is the things that we run on our Linux terminal at root level. Okay. Okay. So the indicator of the malware attack, let's come back to here. Right. You are going to get extra network traffic. So when you're using Wireshark, you're going to see a lot of the activities coming through from that one source. And we can focus on that one source and really monitor, and then we can remove that source quickly. Look at the ports that they're using. Look at, you know, the, the destination system that they're connecting to and so on, right? You want to see indicator for data exfiltration. That means that they're taking your data from your network and bringing it to the external network. So looking at the packets and what kind of data that's flowing in and out. You're also going to get encrypted traffic. And it is harder to find stuff. So using the IPS, right, network intrusion prevention system can evaluate encrypted traffic compared to if you're using a firewall or an intrusion detection system. And in the prior chapter, we talked about that. So the IPS can see, right, the content of your encrypted traffic compared to an IDS. So you have to configure those appliances to really evaluate what your encrypted traffic would be. And then you would have specific IP addresses that's connecting to really do the command and control server. So it would connect to the device, especially your IoT device, and then send that out to an external server. So we want to look for that, right? Where is that coming from and where is that going to? So you're going to see a flood of the same destination server IP, public, right, IP, and it's going to pull the control from your Android devices, your iOS devices, or your PCs. 
And if you have ongoing spams and phishing, and we can monitor that from your email server and your message server, okay? So if you have ongoing spams and phishing, we can block those to really prevent them from entering in the first place. So those are some of the signs that you might see when you have malware attack in your network. Any questions? Okay, so a question that's gonna come up on Security Plus is gonna be your attack vector. So when we say attack vector, it's just a path that the attacker used to gain access to your system. And usually it will be, they study this for a long time. Just imagine a bank robber were trying to rob the bank, right? They're not gonna just run in with a gun. Right, they're gonna watch the exit and the entrance. Who's the guard, right? Looking at the blueprint, where is potentially another exit? How can they enter through underground? You've seen the movie. So the, the attacker is gonna really evaluate the, the attack vector. So when you hear the term attack vectors, it's just a path on how to get there. So if they're in, if they're in Iran, how can they get to a system in the United States? right in seattle washington for example how can they get there quickly and go under the radar and bypass the firewall and things like that so the first step is to really gather information and find out what kind of system what kind of block do i come across what kind of guards am i going to come across right what kind of you know guns does the guard have so it really needs to really evaluate coming in from the email system you know finding the social media, a lot of people posting. So when you work for companies, especially in the security area, do not share your work status information. Okay, that's that's usually the policy. And then non-disclosure agreement, you have to sign a lot of the things you have to sign. And some of the non-disclosure agreement is forever. Not 10 years, not 20 years, forever. Okay, even when you leave the company. Okay. Another term that the book added, I think from this version to the last version is your shadow IT. These are just unauthorized system that is existing in the, in, in the organization. These can potentially hurt your company. So we want to scan. If it's not in our list of inventory, disable it, close the port. Really simple, right? Do not allow people to bring their own stuff and start you know, using it at work. I know here at RCCD, people can bring the system. Sometimes they can connect it, but you know they have to go through IT to make the request. If it was me, no, never, right? I won't allow that because you don't know what, what is brought into your network. And so only allow authorized system. Social engineering is a practice to really get the tactics to psychologically impact the individual to gain something. A lot of the time, flattery when they call and they make you know make comments to you, listen to you, um, or they would assume authority, right? I'm calling from Dell. I need your password to reset something, right? Dell's not gonna call you, right? You call them, and so making sure that you check and validate the information. Um, they also ask people to perform risky action, right? Can you hold the door for me? Um, can you let me into that room? I forgot my key. Um, so when you do testing, sometimes you have to do physical testing where you would see if you can get into certain areas, right? Um, you also you will also see that you can get people to reveal certain information by giving them some tips or hints that you belong to that company or you know you understand exactly what they're talking about. So tailgating is often, so I was at Cisco campus a few years ago. And you know, if you ever visit San Jose, Cisco runs 10 miles, right, square radius. So they have company locations everywhere. So I was at one of the locations and I think I went outside for something for a minute and I got locked out and I can only go through one door. So I stood there and I waited for the employees to come in and I had asked to see if I can go through their door, which comes back around the building. 
And, you know, they have pretty well-trained employees. They won't let me in until I call someone from the inside and that person let me in. Um, so got to make sure that they don't tailgate. Shoulder sharpening, looking over someone, that's very common, right, to get passwords and information. And then you also get some of the host emails that are fake to get you to do things or to give up information, okay? So common techniques for social engineering, you saw that on the page, use flattery or conning. Also assuming authority position, okay? Encourage someone to perform risky action. Encourage someone to review sen reveal sensitive information. Impersonate someone from the inside. The best one is going to be your janitor, right? That those people have access to all doors. Or maintenance crew, IT crew, right? Swear a badge that looks like an IT person, okay? And then tailgate, follow someone in. So how can you prevent tailgating, right? You can use, you know, how you go through the hotel, you've got those, that spinning door, right? That's called turnstile door. It's supposed to limit the number of people that comes in and leaving. Instead of regular door, people can come in and leaving so quickly. The turnstile door slows people down from entering. Also in theme park, you have those turnstile wheel, right? Only one person can come in and you, when you come in, you have to scan your, your wristband or whatever it is. So that's one way that you can slow them down and not really remove everything, right? And then put security guards, okay? To really check, put camera system. I think the turret system really reduce some of the risk because, you know, if you have all these eyes and watching, people tend to commit less crime. So that's what you would see. And in a waterhole attack, they are fake websites that are embedded with different things. I think we, we talked a little bit about this before. So they can also be produced and maintained by ADT, but it is, they are just attempts to discover, right, which website people are likely to visit. So like a shopping website, uh, you know, some tutorial websites. A lot of the ones that I've seen are downloading free stuff websites, uh, free games, free software. Those are the website that malware can enter the quickest. Okay. So it ranges between, you know, you're looking at like hundreds and thousands to more. Okay. That's how they can bring the malware to your system. So in social engineering, an attacker can elicit information by pretending to be actively listening. Or sometimes they are, right? They're just also repeating the same thing you say in question form. Okay. I think there are, if you ever go to like conferences, a lot of times they have training on this. And then they talk about like the psychological impact and how that, you know, there are a lot of studies done in this area now. So they would use reflective questions. They also use false statements, enticing you to correct them and give them the proper sensitive information. And then also bracketing is a way to kind of get some information out there with the range. So if, if I need to get to, to ask you for like an actual financial dollar amount, right? And I would say, oh, well, isn't it approximately 1.5 to $2 million? And then you're going to correct me and say, no, it's actually $1.78 million, right? So that's how I can get you to answer that question is to give you a range of number and that's called bracketing. Okay, so in the pretext, the attacker can use fictitious scenario, fake event, 
and then make that believable to the listener, people from the inside. So that's what pretext is, is to give you some kind of story, right, in the conversation that would, that would make it believable so that way you would disclose or give some trust to that individual and disclose more information. I think social engineer works with trust and the way that you can get people to trust is to impose that you are of a certain authority position or if you connect with them on a certain level, right? Sometimes through gossip, sometimes through things like, oh, you heard this and this about the company and on the inside and then even though it's fake, right? That's really a Any question? Okay. So dumpster diving is a big area. We always shred everything that's sensitive. Okay. So there are companies that you can you can send your paper and CD and hard drive to and they will take care of that for you with the contract because if you throw it in the trash someone can dumpster dive and get information and even when you shred them into pieces right they can piece it together and and get stuff so our government is usually back in the days in the 70s they used to burn things right but burning things is not always accessible to all companies so you can actually have shredders and things like that um, typo spotting, this has happened a lot for URL jacking. Um, it is a way for them to make a website look really close to the legitimate, legitimate website. For example, like Bank of America website, it will be really close to the URL where they typo swat for a domain that looks very close to that. So they register for a domain that looks very close to the legitimate one. And then they would use that to get you to click something. So that's called URL hijacking with clickjacking. Um, there's so many different types of attacks. So now they can also run something malicious from embed something there. Um, they can also use it to earn money to do different things. So you see some of these out there. Have you ever try like, you know, you ever have like one character off from the normal website that you access, you would see these sites that come up. Those are your typo squatting sites. There's not a lot of law that prevent them from doing that. And that's been around since the 80s, right? Um, and then we talked about the waterhole and the licitation already, okay? So another thing that I did mention is the prepending compared to the pretexting. So the prepending, is that you can add something at the beginning, right? Like an email, you can add the subject or the header or the body of the, the email to really entice people to, to give you some information, right? Uh, a friend in, in need or whatever, right? So sometimes you would see that coming through for phishing purposes. Okay, so to really prevent phishing, People need to be aware of, right, what source that is. Be aware of that. And they're very smart about things nowadays, right? They look for the type of activity you use. Um, so fish to install things or fish to get money. Spear phishing is different because it's targeting a certain group or an individual. Normally, you would see this in an enterprise environment, like a group of executives or you know, a group of companies. Whaling is an attempt to really look at the high level executive, your C level, your CIO, your CEO, and so on. Those are called whaling. It's a form of phishing that targets executive. Vishing is um, to give, to call and get people to give up information. Like, you know, those robocall that gets you to, your IRS is looking for you right now, right? That's vishing. And then you got smishing, which is your SMS phishing, and that's coming through your text messages. Okay. So identity fraud is really 
a lot of the time people commit identity theft to pretend to be someone else so they can commit identity fraud credit card fraud um benefit fraud a lot of things insurance fraud that comes with that too then you got a bunch of other things like invoice scamming trick people to pay with a fake invoice credential harvesting is to get a list of password and and user account and sometimes that can be done through sql injection or just you know accessing a certain file in the company so reconning is about gathering information on the target that's the first step that takes the longest in my opinion okay because attack should be fast and move laterally should be really fast okay let's answer the next part so we talked about um the difference between whaling and spear phishing whaling targets executives or high level executives spear phishing just target a, a certain group of individuals almost done let me move that down so it's on the next page so we can see everything else and then we uh for 19 we talked about vishing which is voice fishing that's your social engineer tactic to get, get information via phone calls right i think the older generation tend to fall for this because they make it very believable to them, right? They don't want to get charged by the, the IRS or fined by the IRS. Or sometimes they will call and they would say they're calling from Social Security benefits and so on. So you we you know, I think people need to be aware of these types of situations and not, you know, responding to it. Okay. But it is organized crime. You have all of these robocalls and all of these people at work and so on. The primary purpose of credential harvesting is to gather username and password information to access system and networks. And this can also be exchanged for very cheap. Any questions? So the protection in our system for anti-malware is we need to really run your security software. So we want to install the application regularly update it and scan it so my students they always ask me like how often should i update and how often should i scan as often as you use your internet so if you are a regular person that downloads that uh, you know visit the web that does a lot of things on the internet you should do it daily okay so we want to make sure that we run are anti-malware in the back. So keep that on and don't turn it off, okay? And then we wanna be aware of the scams and some of the resources that can manipulate us as user. And it's always good to really educate the people that you live with or work with, okay? You should share, share stories to them or or because you can protect your system as much as possible, but also there are other entities that's using your system, like your children, your family members, that can impact your network if they are not safe. Okay. So when you're using anti malware, I know this is a lot in verbiage. Um, Anti-malware works in a certain area, right? The traditional way is to use signature. So whenever you run updates 
what that is, is it's updating the signature files that's used for detection. What is a malware defined as? What kind of malware, right? So in your anti-malware, it contains a database of your malware signature. And this database would have a list of known malware and what kind of, what makes them a certain type of malware, okay? And then your quarantine malware, those are not harmful to the system, but it still exists for analysis. So when your, your antivirus or your anti-malware application quarantines something, it doesn't allow that malware to be active, but that malware is still in your system, right? So let's say that if I reformat my drive and reinstall the application, can the malware persist? It can if that area on your disk or your SSD is not overwritten, okay? Very low case that you would see that malware would persist through those things, but you know, that's, this is why sometimes when you have an infected system, severely infected system, you should really zero out the disk before you reinstall and reformat. It also uses what's called heuristic-based detection which is what it's known to not be in the signature, such as zero-day exploits. It's designed to protect live for the sand or sandboxing code. So any kind of activities that would be viral, it would see that as, as a malware, okay? This is a, try in my opinion, this is a catch-all area um, I think that we can be better with AI in the long run um, on how that behavior changes from system to system. But for now, I think that, you know, companies start to move into AI and it is an area that we can further improve. Okay, so when you do your homework this week, you're gonna read a section on that on how AI can impact, right, malware in the future. It also check what's called integrity of the file. If a, a malware comes in and impact that file, it changes that file status or state. So if it look at the integrity, we can look at the hash for that file. And if the value of the hash don't match, we can say that that file has been modified. So basically it recalculates the hash value for your files that exist on the system, and that's how it can check for file integrity. And then we can look at data execution prevention, your DEP. This is a feature in how certain region of the memory is marked as non-executable. This is gonna prevent the code from using that region to execute certain areas. So I think looking at the anti-malware on how it uses this feature to really prevent things, a little bit more intuitive than what you've seen about a decade or two decades ago. So the principle of social engineering we talked about authority. You don't have to put everything down there, right? People tend to be afraid of authority, so they would be compliant and, and believe that those individuals are from an authority organization. Uh, an, an, they hold authority roles. Sometimes they would use intimidation, bullying of tactics, okay? A lot of time, you know, getting people to do something you know, time is running out. You have to act on this now, right? Or the IRS is gonna come and arrest you tomorrow, okay? Mm -hmm. Also consensus, right? Your friends and your family members that I have contacted all agree to do this. Therefore, I think you should pursue it as well, right? So consensus, get, if the mass people are you influenced by, scarcity. Time is running out. There's only one left, right? 
So if you're looking at the social engineering in our media, in our e-commerce world, they all they all use this, right? Right? Amazon, you have 30 minutes to, to purchase this, right? Before your discount goes away, right? <laughs> Scarcity. There's only one item left, right? If you want it, you have to act on it now. Urgency encouraged immediate response. Familiarity, you really need to come encourage to commit to a certain action that's similar. And lastly, trust is the key to build the relationship. So to do the social engineering, you have to really analyze some of these areas and then take advantage of that, right? To really build trust with the people, to be a good time. To get people to believe you, to get people to commit to certain actions based on familiarity, based on bullying tactics, based on urgency, and so on. There are books and books have written about this. So, and transitioning from this, right, these are the core, but then you would see like different areas, like outside of fishing, outside of the things that we've seen, that's always changing. Any questions? So when you get those links and things in the message, don't click it, okay? And tell people don't click it. If you don't recognize the number, then don't use it. All right. Any question on this before we do the last two, which takes up the rest of our time? So I added some areas like gaslighting, okay? And then the steps in this, so you can check out the diagram if you're a visual person on how they would go through the step and attack. Okay, and then we're gonna come back to this down the line when we talk about ethical hacking and event testing. So gathering information is this, right? That's the first step. And then getting people, so once you learn more about those people, you would want to craft the messages to get them to do things for you, right? That saves the purpose. So if I can get their password, why would I need to brute force and spend hours and time and minutes doing that? I can just have them type in their password for me, right? And then I will be able to have the text file for that. So getting the user to do that, right? Trick them to give them the potential credential or I can call and get, get the password. Also, after I get that, I would get into the system, okay? I would log into their account, um, their banking account, whatever it is. And then I would look at the type of data and activity Okay, and then I can send that data out to another server. Okay, a lot of times attacker would clean up after that. Okay, they would delete the back door that they created so you don't know that they're in. So there are times that attacker comes into an organization, did whatever they did, left and not knowing. It's kind of like a thief going into your house, had a feast at night, took your money, left, and you're still unaware. You're still sleeping. You woke up like nothing happened, right? So, you know, and in the past, that happened to us right now. Hopefully, we have detection system that's better, um, that would raise the alarm, that will block them before. Okay. So here, the rest have some malware information using um, advanced malware tool like your AMP, okay? Educate people, that's very important, okay? And then it, it touches on some of the rest. So before we start doing this, I wanna share with you some resources. So your book goes into this, um, which is very useful, okay? So you have the OSINT. This is a way that we can connect to other organization and other people in the world and other nation to share resources. So you have the, v, uh, the, the NVD, which is the vulnerability database, where what kind of tools are vulnerable, 
and we need to know that. Many organizations maintain their own CVE, but there is a way that you can access it. And this is maintained by Mitre. They've been around for a long time. So this organization lists all the common vulnerability. So the attacker can go there to look for things, but we can go there to look for things too, right? To reduce our vulnerability. So it's, it's a double blade sword, right? It's one of those that they can look for and we can look for it. We need to really see it, know it, to protect it, but they can use it to harm us. Um, and then there are additional information here that I can give you regarding taxi sticks, um, automated indicator, and then the dark web. So we are gonna do a little bit of tour because I'm intrigued by Tor through my Python class. I've used it before, Onion Router is fun to use. So I wanna show you how you can use Tor in case you need to. Not that I encourage you to go to the dark web and look for things that might hurt you, um, but Tor is only one area. You can also look at Freenet, um, I2P, Rifle, those are the other ones. And Tor is prevalent. Okay, so we'll talk about that. So those, the, that's the area of the web that you don't normally access through Google and, you know, your regular browser. It uses different browser. Okay. And then um, other things like information centers and things like that. So those are all your resources that you want to be able to use to really look at what's happening, right? What kind of current things that's impacting enterprises like yours. Okay. And then if you really want to see the threat map, you can click on one of these links and it gives you the visualization on the not service attack or any form of attack. Um, FireEye is pretty cool. NetScout, there's a lot of companies that gives you information via a visual uh, page. Okay. All right. And then some of your other resources are here. Okay. Conferences. Um, I'll try to see if the, 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 um, if the school is going to pay for the cybersecurity conferences that's going to come up in uh, later this month, I mean, later this year, October, I think. And if, if they are, then I'll let you know. If you're interested, you can attend virtually or physically. Okay. All right. So let's look at the exercise we have to do. You are going to look at Microsoft. The reason why I chose Microsoft is it's known to be very vulnerable. Okay. So you know why you're getting all those updates notification? Because if Microsoft finds it, they have to fix it. And how they fix it is to send you updates, right? So if you're using Edge, the browser, like what I have here on my taskbar, right? So this is some of the area, okay? Now, that's not the only area. If you scroll down, you're gonna see a lot more. You're gonna see like Windows endpoint, Windows 10 issues, Windows 10 on ARM, other areas, okay? And if you look at the impact, spoofing, escalation of privileges, Right, so we weigh in the risk in using the system that someone can be in our system at the same time acting as an administrator. <laughs> okay, so once you click on that link, you are going to select a CVE of your choice. If you're lazy, just click the top, look at that, okay, and view the details. Tell me your the type of attack vector. How can they get in? Okay. The reason why I'm showing you this is one day, you are going to have to research this for your own company, right? Like when you go to work and you found out, oh my gosh, this happens because like wanna cry happened because this issue with Microsoft OS. So you have to find out how you're gonna be able to fix it, okay? Okay, so let's say if I want to select one of these, uh, let's do the PowerShell one that looks kind of interesting. Okay. You can click release notes. Okay. So here they tell you like what happened. Okay. Which version had fixes and so on. Uh, let me 
me see. Hold on. So if I click the CVE, when you click, click the CVE number, okay? Not the other stuff, because that just gives you the article, like the release note, it's just their notification. Here, it's gonna tell you, this is the ranking of, it's a score system that they use, and Mitre came up with that, right? I, I put the note on, on your assignment. So not that Microsoft has to log it, they have to log it na internationally, right? Any software company that found an issue of vulnerability, they have to create this, okay? And it says assigning CNA. I click on buffer overflow, this one, right? So, you know, you can select the, the one that you want to see. And then the attack vector, it tells you right here, whether it is network or whether it's another application. So put that down. Okay, and then it also tells you the category, right? If it's low impact, if it's high impact, right? They cannot prove that it is exploiting the code. Official fix. If you're interested in the Xbox ones, there's a bunch of stuff on Xbox too. Okay, because it's Microsoft. Okay, so click the CVEs. Okay, so I was here and I just choose one of the ones I wanted to see. Okay, you can go further if you want. That's just earlier on and then look at. So, so there are only a certain number of category in the attack vector, right? Either it's network or it's local, okay? And it tells you right here, specific to how it is local. This is a database that they've maintained for many, many years, okay? Along with Mitre. Mitre maintained the international ones for all companies. Okay, so answer the question. What is the level of complexity? Is it low, high, medium? Okay. Then you are gonna visit this. This is gonna show you, right, the how they determine the value that number, that scoring system, okay? This is called the CVSS scoring system. This is how that they, they're able to scale. So coming back to what I was looking at, this score right here, right, is based on that scale, okay? So when I look at this 5.5 .5 or 4.8, okay, and that's just the score information. And so for the matrix, how do they determine that? They use all of these points, okay? And that's how it's gonna be able to give you that score, okay? And that's another entity that maintained this. So all the technical company, they got together and said, oh, we have to find a way to rank these things, right? So if the higher the score, the more severe it is. And so we wanna make sure that we fix the issue if it's higher in score, okay? So what I'm showing you there is, if you read this information, it talks about how, right, they come up with the scoring system. So when you're looking at the matrix, there are the base matrix, the, the temporary and uh, environmental and so on, okay? And how they score, okay? Will you have to figure this out one day unless you work in this area for development? But, you know, knowing what it is, is important, okay? So that way, in case you need to work with it again. So here, if you are looking at the basic metrics, exploitable, right? If it's vulnerable and it's exploitable, um, attack vector and so on. So let's answer the question. What is the... Determine the values for number for number 24A and the number 24B. So if you put down that this is low, okay, and the attack vector is network, for example, go to the site. Uh, 
Yeah. I thought it's further down. Where, Mike? Um, oh, yeah, yeah. It is further down. Yeah, 7.4, you can go to the matrix value, which I was at. So if it's low, you would put 0 0.77, or if it's high, it's 0 0.44, right? You just go to the section 4, 7.4. And then if it's local, it's this. So what I'm showing you is like those elements add up to be a certain score. And that's how they're able to do that, okay? So put down, based on your answer for A and B, put down the, the actual value. Okay. And then looking at the CVSS at the top, then for 25, we are gonna visit this. Okay, so if you ever wanna be a buck bounty hunter, <laughs> um, here I have you click on buck bounty program, and then you are going to pick the choice, okay? So click bounty programs. Uh, wait, yeah. And then when you come down here, you're gonna choose the one that you want to look at. But in general, if you look, right, a lot of things are ongoing and this is how Microsoft can get people to help them to find the issues with the application after the beta test, okay? It's best to get an external perspective and there are people to pay this. I don't know if you've seen documentation on Buck Bounty. There are people who live and die for these things. It's scary. Um, organizations going after individual who found stuff that not they're not supposed to be found, right? So the Red Hat people, this is what they do. They find the issues and they fix it. Those guys that found that cars that could be hacked, right? And they show how that, that could be done. And so they show, and. So that way the firmware needs to be updated. So these are some of the areas that you can get into for, and the price is, is good, right? You see there's some people that they do this professionally. I've seen developers that have done this professionally. That's all they do, right? Every time that they turn something in, they can get paid up to a certain amount of money, right? But then also the other area that there's a lot of, you know, propaganda saying that, the bounty hunters are the ones that that are being targeted by these organizations because you know they they are sharing the resources out. So, is that true or not? It's really you know when I I saw the the documentary they when they interview these people, these people like you know they blur out their face and stuff and they did talk about you know after they have done some jobs for these companies these companies were actually going after them. Whether it's true, we don't know right? And then on the dark web, there are a lot of the resources that are posted by people and groups as well, shared before it even hits some of these areas, okay? So sometimes you have to venture into that to find. So I can click, uh, let's do the Xbox one that looks interesting, okay? And then it goes over the rules for submissions, how, and then different level, right? So, you know, the Xbox had issues in the past and, it, you know, there are continuing issues, okay? So if you find like small features, it's cheaper than if you find the more prevalent feature, it's more, they pay you more, okay? So once you've done that, right, just describe the vulnerability criteria that you see on that page. What are you looking for? What kind of things, okay? and then you would submit your assignment. So here, I got security impact, right? Bypassing security feature, escalation of privilege. That's very common. Remote code execution, somebody can run a, a script remotely. That's scary, right? Tampering spoofing, denial of service.
So your vulnerabilities exist for Xbox is cross-site scripting, um, many things, forgery, server-side code execution, injection, oh, so many things. So beware, Xbox is not safe. <laughs> Okay, when we're finished, go ahead and submit your assignment on Canvas or you have until Sunday to do so. Okay. And I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording before I forget.